Hi, my name is Charles Dark, and welcome to the After Dark Show. Today I will be telling you some stories. I hope you enjoy. Nice to Aunt Martha. She could live another 20 years, Brittany said. Unless we help her along, Todd said. She takes a dozen pills every day. It would be easy to overdose on the wrong combination. He said it as nonchalantly as if he were discussing what to have for dinner. Brittany looked at the house again. It gets too hot in Phoenix, she said. We need to get that will. Then we'll go to Auntie's apartment and help her take her medicine. An ancient Ford was parked next to the house. We'll take Aunt Martha's car, Todd said. In case the cops are looking for mine, she leaves the keys in it. This time, Todd drove. After I lay down on the back seat, I peeked at my phone, hoping to see a message from Mom saying that help was on the way. The phone was dark. My battery needed to recharge. My texts had never been sent. Fear and despair washed over me. As soon as Todd and Brittany realized there wasn't any will, I knew they'd shoot me. Brittany said, Let's go, let's go, and the Ford shot forward. Seconds later, Todd swore and hit the brake. I sat up. Two squad cars, blue lights whirling, blocked our path. Police, yelled a voice. Get out with your hands in the air. Two officers approached. Stay down, Todd told Brittany. She put her head on her knees. He grabbed the gun and rolled down his window. He was going to shoot the police. As he raised the gun, I attacked from behind. My hands circled his throat, jerking his head backward. The gun fired into the air. Todd struggled. I held on. He pointed the gun over his shoulder at me. Bang! I heard the bullet whiz past my ear and shatter the back window. Brittany looked up, then dug her nails into my arm, trying to pull my hand away. Bang! This shot came from behind the Ford. One officer had sneaked around and approached from the rear. Todd yelped and dropped his gun. Police quickly surrounded us. It's your fault, Brittany cried. We would have been rich. An officer read Todd and Brittany their rights. They were frisked and handcuffed, and Todd's minor arm wound was treated. An officer took my name and asked if I was okay. Yes, they were going to kill me. You saved my life. And you saved ours, he replied. Is there an older hostage, too? No. How did you know I was here? We didn't. A police detective followed a tip from a burglary victim and went to question the owner of this property. He found her tied up in her apartment. She said her nephew had kidnapped her sister and was taking her to this address. Mrs. Pameron gets confused, I said. She thought I was Maud. My picture was in the paper the next day, under the headline, Teen Catches Robber, Prevents Cop Shooting. The article said that Todd and Brittany had committed 20 burglaries plus the bank robberies. The trunk of his car contained an assault rifle, three laptops, and a bag of cocaine. They sold most of the stolen goods themselves to pawn shops or on eBay and Craigslist, but used Mrs. Pameron as a fence for antiques. They took advantage of her confusion by pretending the goods belonged to Maud. When the reporter contacted Mrs. Pameron's daughter, who lived in another state, she came immediately to help her mother. That afternoon, Claire came to the shop. Look, she said, holding out her hand. The poison ring. The police found it by the sink in Mrs. Pameron's apartment. Rosie got her computer back, too. All because you spotted my ring and followed that awful woman. Which she should not have done, Mom said. I grinned. After six days of fear, the antiques business was fun again. Dragonfly Eyes by Elaine Ferguson. Read by Christine Vam. Monday morning. On the floor of my science classroom, I, Savannah Rose Anderson, woke up dead. A bullet pierced my skull and my body crumpled beneath me. 
thudding hard on the school's linoleum floor. There was no pain, no feeling at all, but a last quiet breath, and then nothing. Now, as I open transparent lids, I realize time and space have bent around me. There is a blankness as I try to comprehend the fact that my soul and body have lost their connection. I have been ripped apart, a cloth rent in two. Savannah! A girl named Claire lunges toward my body as the man who killed me yanks Claire's hair, twisting it around his fist like a scarf until her chin snaps up. With arms strong as cables, he shoves the muzzle of the gun into Claire's cheek as he yells at her to shut up. She looks at him with wild eyes. Her heart drums so hard I'm afraid it might burst. Claire, I whisper. Somehow I understand that I can move in a way I never did in life. Like steam, I rise up toward the ceiling. Beneath me, I see blood that seeps from my head into a pool of vivid scarlet. My blood. As easily as one snuffs out a candle, I have ceased to be. And yet, I still exist. This new state of being confuses me. One of my shoes has landed three feet away, and my fingers curl from my palm as though they are petals of a flower. It's so strange, truly seeing myself from the outside, not a reflection of my face in a mirror, but the whole of who I was. I know this man shot me, but I cannot explain why. I close my eyes and try to remember. Then my memory returns full force, so that I gasp. One hour before, I'd been sitting at my desk, listening to Mr. Ward as he explained a dragonfly's prismatic vision, while a boy named James yawned sleepily at a desk to my left. The dragonfly has amazing sight, because as it flies, it can scan 360 degrees in every direction. Mr. Ward intoned while drawing a hexagon on the whiteboard with a green marker. A dragonfly has the best perception of any creature on Earth. Their senses are almost magical. And then, a loud crack of the door followed by shrill screams as my killer burst inside our classroom, his gun held out in front of him, both hands gripping the handle tight. Give me two hostages. I want two. Now, now, now! In the end, the man had chosen me and Claire, classmates who could not have been more different. I, who have sparkled all my life, and Claire, quiet, friendless, awkward, strange. You, with the long blonde hair, he had screamed, pointing directly at me. And you! The gun had snapped over to Claire. I want you both to stand by the window, or I'll start shooting your friends. The rest of you, get out! Move, move, move! In death, I see the irony of our lives, mine and Claire's, how they'd become irrevocably intertwined in that one random act. I remember the girls crying, the boys stoic as they shuffled by me in a single file, how Mr. Ward had tried to stay in the room but was forced to leave when my killer shot the window so that the glass exploded onto the countertop in a galaxy of stars. How Claire and I had clung to each other while outside police car lights flashed and the fire truck wailed. To my shame, I remember this, too. Wishing that if one of us should have to die, let it be Claire. How selfish I was in life. How clear is my vision in death? Why did you kill her? Claire chokes out each word. I told them! I told them! He releases her hair and kicks the ribs of my body with the toe of his boot. What is left of me rocks gently on the linoleum. They'll believe me now. I killed the pretty one. She's dead. They'll hear that. His breath swirls out of his mouth. I have never seen air before. 
It's strange, the way I perceive everything, even thoughts, as if I, too, possess the dragonfly's prismatic vision. My killer's name is Drew. Seamed lines fanned down to his neck, and there is dirt beneath his fingernails. The soul is twisted and dark as tree roots. They only listen to blood, he shouts. His spittle hits Claire's skin. Claire is thinking that she has only moments to live, and I know she is right. I am swirling above her, powerless. Claire whispers my name so softly that Drew does not hear. I swoop in close so that my forehead almost touches hers. As easily as reading a book, I look inside her, and I see an amazing thing. Claire's soul is shining. It's filled with some kind of essence, gold and white, bright as the edge of the sun. The girl I had always dismissed amazes me with her light. With my new sight, I follow the threads of her life as they unfurl like ribbons. I follow one and see how she loved James quietly, too shy to speak. There is Claire making dinner in a tiny kitchen, laughing as she drains noodles. I see her looking in a mirror, her mouth pressed into a thin line until she sighs and shakes her head as she walks away. I watch her read a book to a small boy. I see her strain as she cleans garbage from a gutter. There is another strand unwinding. In it, I see myself and my friends as we laugh at Claire behind cupped hands. We snicker at her black clothes, her odd hair, whisper at the thickness of her thighs. Claire understood she was an object of our ridicule, and yet, amazingly, she grieves that I am gone. In death, I am ashamed. How can I have been so blind? Nothing on this side matters the way it did when I was alive. Not shoes or the clothes I had so carefully worn. Here, there is no status. Love is the only thing that crosses over with the soul. And Claire is filled with it. Don't worry. I'll let you live. Drew lies to Claire now. His words are the color of my blood. Panic rises through me and shoots out of my fingers in electric waves. Drew is going to murder Claire. And then himself. The pictures flash through his mind. He wants to be remembered forever. A celebrity for eternity. Pages of his manifesto are tucked into the pocket of his jeans. No! I scream. Emotion shoots through me in flames, pulsing through me like a fire to scorch everything inside. My hand hits him, but it passes through him without a mark. I am helpless. We're going to the window, you and me, Drew tells Claire. The police heard that gunshot. They'll want to know which girl is still alive. He will kill her at the window so that everyone will be a witness. I can taste Claire's fear as she struggles, begging for her life. Her words mean nothing to him. I concentrate with everything I have, pushing against the molecules of air. Outside, lawmen decide to break into the school. But I know they will be too late. The trigger cocks. Claire squeezes her eyes tight because she feels her own death coming. She pictures her parents and thinks of God. Now! I scream to no one, to everyone. I don't understand how I do it, but I feel myself compress my spirit into a tiny point and shoot myself into the tip of Drew's trigger finger. Everything inside me pulses as I inhabit his very cells. I feel his blood surge and the adrenaline storm through his veins. But I am matching his energy. I discover I can move his flesh. With that knowledge, I strain with everything inside of me. What the... He cries as the gun inches away from Claire. Cursing, Drew tries to regain control. But I intensify my focus. 
His eyes go wide as his hand snaps to his own temple. My energy is like a laser as I turn my soul into fire. A shot splits the air. An instant later, Drew falls to the floor, close to my own broken body as my spirit breaks free. A blackness pools into the floor with a moan, and he is gone, a shadow melting. It is over. The only sound is Claire's ragged breathing. Oh my God! Claire cries, dropping to her knees. Spattered in Drew's blood, she leans over to touch my lifeless body, tears streaming down her face. She cries in loud gulps while I rejoice in the fact that she is alive. Savannah! She gasps. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. The space that separates us seems thin as gauze, but she does not sense that I am still here, right next to her. It's okay, I tell her. I stroke her head, my hand brushing the coils of her red hair, but she cannot feel me. The energy I had has dissipated, and I am once again without touch. I look into my body's blank eyes, a deep water blue. There is so much I should have done when I was alive, when things mattered. But I was given this one bit of grace. Because of me, Claire will go on. The police are running inside the building, and I know they are just moments away. When I look ahead, I see there will be a huge funeral inside the gym for me, with thousands of flowers emanating their oversweet scent. Everyone will weep and secretly wonder if Claire should have been taken instead of me. The thought makes me sad. Because like a dragonfly, I perceive with a panoramic vision that reveals truth. Neither one of us should have been taken in that wasteful act of violence. But it is Claire, not me, who is destined to accomplish amazing things. The girl I ignored will leave her mark on the world in a way I never could. To know this helps me accept my fate. The understanding is bittersweet, a lesson learned too late on Earth. And yet I see a new purpose in my lingering here. From this side, I believe the right girl lived. And I'll be watching her. Every day, until we meet again. Jeepers Peepers by Ryan Brown Read by Eileen Stevens Darkness had fallen, but the late August air still hung hot and thick over the bayou when Elizabeth Nolan finally reached her destination. The babysitting job had required her to leave her own neighborhood, where the roads were actually paved, and drive halfway around the lake after dark. Seething at the very idea, she almost turned for home right then, but she knew she couldn't. She needed the money. School started back next week, and she had no fall wardrobe to speak of, and a summer spent mostly at the mall or lying by the pool had left her flat broke. And that's not to mention the good old take some initiative, show some responsibility speech her parents had been giving her. Resigned, she turned off the ignition. Her ears buzzed with the screech of the crickets and cicadas in the surrounding woods. She opened the driver's door and heard water trickling in the distance. And to her horror, from somewhere much closer by, she heard the wet, throaty croak of a frog. Great, she thought. Frogs, how fan freaking tastic! Stealing herself, she stepped out of the car. The house was a single-story shack, tucked under sprawling live oak limbs that wept streams of moss onto its corrugated tin roof. Funny thing about those moss-strewn trees, she thought. Lining the manicured fairways at the country club near her house, they offered a certain majestic beauty. But out here, they had a much more depressing effect, adding to the ghostly gloom of the place. The house was as square as a cracker box, and sat at a tilt on crumbling cinder blocks. It had a screened front door, beyond which a dull light glowed. But Elizabeth couldn't make out anything except yellowing walls inside. 
The female figure appeared behind the screen. You're late. Elizabeth stepped onto an elevated porch riddled with rusted tools and bald tires. Yes, I'm sorry. The woman didn't open the door, but remained a faceless silhouette behind the screen. You near enough made me late. I can't afford to get myself fired, you know. Not my situation. Despite the hostile tone, her words came out slow and cool, almost in a whisper. Elizabeth swallowed hard. Again, I apologize. It's sort of a long way out here, and I got a little lost past the fork, where the road veers off into the, um, swamp. Pardon? Call it what it is. City folk will call it the bayou, but I say call it what it is. Well, uh, anyway, I got here as quickly as I could. It was a last-minute call, so I had to rearrange my schedule and everything. I had no choice about that. I was desperate. No one else would come. Elizabeth didn't even want to think about the meaning of the last comment. Well, I'm glad I could help out, she said, trying to lighten the exchange. She reached into her purse. I've got a list of references here if you'd like to see them. Would have done. But I don't read too good, and I hadn't the time anyhow. You been sitting kids long? Since eighth grade, and I used to babysit my cousins sometimes before that. Elizabeth sensed the woman sizing her up from head to toe, studying her. Well, she sighed, I got no choice. You're here, and I gotta be off. So where's a... Webster? Wilbur. Right, sorry. Wilbur. He's gone to bed already. Maybe he won't need no tending to at all. That's fine. I'm sure I can keep myself busy with... Then again, there's times when my Wilbur needs a little... The woman's words drifted off. She drew a deep breath, then exhaled slowly. Well... Sometimes he needs a little extra care. I hope you can see to that. Her tone had grown eerily sober. Elizabeth waited a few beats for further explanation that never came. You mean bad dreams? She said. Well, sure. I think I can handle that. Is there a number where I can reach you? I could call if I thought there was any reason for concern. Ain't no phone here. But when we spoke, I called you from the bait shop up yonder. Mr. Simmons there done me a favor. Found your ad on that computer of his and gave me your number. I was desperate, you see. Oh, okay. Well, it doesn't matter. I brought my cell phone. She dug the phone out of her purse and turned it on. Her stomach sank when the screen came up. Oh, um, unfortunately, I don't seem to be getting a signal. You know, I would stay and tend to him myself if I could, the woman said. It breaks my heart to have to leave my boy like this. You believe that, don't you? There was a tinge of sadness in her voice now. Elizabeth stared into the faceless shadow. Well, yeah. I I'm sure if you could... God almighty, I how I hate to leave him. Especially... Especially in his condition. The implication made Elizabeth uneasy. But the woman continued before she could ask the nature of the boy's condition. But I got no choice, do I? I got to work to keep him fed and tended to. Look after his needs and such. It's just me and him, you see. Elizabeth nodded. Yes, I think I understand. So is there anything special I need to know? Anything you need to know, you'll find out, I suppose. It wasn't the answer Elizabeth had hoped for. She slapped a mosquito feasting on the back of her neck. 
the swarming insects were the only thing making her eager to get inside. I think I can take it from here. You shouldn't be late for work. No, I surely shouldn't. The woman shifted her weight, bringing her face into the glow of the light bulb dangling from a cord in the room behind her. Her beauty took Elizabeth aback. She was younger than Elizabeth had expected, giving the maturity of her voice, probably mid-twenties. Her skin was flawless and smooth. Her hair was pulled back into a neat bun, stabbed through with a pencil pocked with teeth marks. Her honey-brown eyes looked weary from too much work and too little sleep. And yet, whether she wanted them to or not, the eyes betrayed a palpable kindness. Elizabeth found it strangely disarming and couldn't help but smile. What is it? The woman asked, noticeably defensive. Nothing. I just... She didn't know how to answer. Her eyes fell to the charm at the woman's neck, a tarnished W hanging from a thin silver chain. That's pretty, she said, indicating the necklace. W for Wilbur, I'm guessing, right? He must be very special to you. The woman seemed flustered by the flattery. Yes, she said. He is a very special child. The door creaked open, and a hand extended across the threshold. What do they call you again? Elizabeth. My name's Grace. They shook. The woman's skin was coarse, but her grip was delicate, feminine, God bless you for looking after my boy. She glanced over her shoulder. Take good care of him, won't you? He's all I got. I'll be back at dawn. She moved past Elizabeth and stepped off the porch, trailing a scent of cheap perfume. Turning back, she brought her eyes up slowly. You seem like a nice girl. I'd have liked to get to know you. Elizabeth shrugged. Well, who knows? Perhaps you will. No. The woman shook her head and her smile faded. You won't be back. None of them ever come back a second time. She turned and started off on foot into the darkness. The scream came three hours later. Elizabeth's resting eyes popped open she shot upright from the tattered sofa and stood quickly. Too quickly, she became dizzy. The room was like an oven, stifling and airless. Sweat stung her eyes, forcing them shut again and leaving her completely disoriented. She felt something brush against the back of her head and spun around in fright, swatting at the air. Glass shattered. Broken shards rained down on her. She opened her eyes again to find herself in total darkness. It was then that she realized she had just swatted the dangling bulb, sending the house's only light source crashing into the ceiling. Panic gripped her as another scream rang out of the boy's room, louder than the first. She ran blindly across the living room and continued past the kitchenette to the closed door at the end of the narrow hall. She fumbled for the knob, then flung open the door. Mama! Elizabeth rubbed the wall in search of a light switch. No, Wilbur, it's not your... Help me, Mama. The creepers are coming. Calm down, Wilbur. It was just a bad dream. Come, Mama, please. I'm not your mother, Wilbur, she called into the darkness. I'm your babysitter. Everything's okay now. Come, please. Giving up on the search for a light switch, she made a move toward the frightened voice but tripped on something that sent her tumbling to the floor. What happened? The boy cried. It's okay. I just tripped, that's all. Are you all right? I'm sc scared, he stammered. I want to see you. Please, let me touch you. She heard his arm slapping the bed. I'm coming. Don't be scared. She managed to get to her knees. Can you reach a lamp, Wilbur? Or tell me where one is? 
I can't see a thing. Ain't none. You don't have a light in your room? She exclaimed. No, ma'am. No light. Well, do you know where your mother keeps the spare bulbs? I seem to have broken the one in the living room. Don't know about no bulbs, he said. She keeps matches in the kitchen, though. Candles, too, I think. I only know because she told me never to mess with them. I'm going to step back into the other room and get them. No! I'll just be right outside, and I'll keep the door open, okay? Don't leave me! I'm not leaving you, Wilbur. I have to get us some light so we can see. Then keep talking, he pleaded. Please, miss. Keep on letting me hear you when you go. I will. Promise! A promise. She made it out of the room, and with her outstretched arms patting madly at the air, she at last found the kitchenette. She could still hear the fright in Wilbur's panting breath and made a point to call out to him every few seconds. After rummaging through cabinets and drawers cluttered with cookware and utensils, her hand fell on what she thought was a candlestick. A quick sniff of vanilla-scented wax confirmed it. She found a box of matches in the same drawer and lit the candle. When she returned to the bedroom, Wilbur was sitting upright in his bed. His pajamas were soaked with sweat. Somehow the boy she had pictured in her head didn't look like the boy she saw now. She had imagined a child more, well, different. Younger, perhaps, given the degree of his terror. He looked to be about eight or nine and had the face of a cherub. You okay? She asked, standing at the door. Think so, he whispered. For now. He wiped the tear streaks from his cheeks. It's all over. You woke up, you see. So it's all over now. That don't always help, miss. Elizabeth, will you come over here, Miss Elizabeth? His arms reached out toward her. Taking care about where she stepped this time, she went to him and took a seat on the edge of the bed. The mattress was like a wet sponge. A faded Snoopy sheet lay twisted across it. It's okay now. She took his hand and gave it a reassuring squeeze. He quickly took his hand back. Let me touch you. It was the second time he had made the peculiar request. May I, Miss Elizabeth? Would you mind? Well, I... His hand came up. She winced instinctively as the soft pads of his fingers began to trace the contours of her face. Over her eyes, down both sides of her nose, across her mouth, and under her chin. Then his other hand moved to the top of her head and slowly raked down the length of her hair. He smiled, a grin missing two lower teeth. Now I can see you. I reckon you can close your mouth now. Elizabeth closed her jaw, which had fallen open in shock. Oh, my God, she whispered, unable to mask the astonishment in her voice. You can't see. I'm blind, but I can still see. I know how you look now, that's for sure. You can help me out by telling me the color of your hair and eyes, though. Um, blue? You got blue hair? No, I meant... I mean, I have blue eyes and blonde hair. I know. <laughs> I was just teasing you. A frown creased his face. Blue eyes? Mm. Mama says blue is cold. And blonde is like yellow, right? A hot color. I'm sorry, I don't understand. That's how Mom explains colors. Says they got a feeling to them. Blue's cold, yellow's hot, orange is warm. 
Well, I don't feel much like nothing at all. And black, well, I got a pretty good idea what black's like. See plenty of that, that's for sure. His meaning finally dawned on her. You were born blind, right? You've never actually seen colors. Yep, born blind. Nope, never seen colors. But I can still see. Too good sometimes, in fact. Elizabeth held up the candle and looked around the windowless room. Scattered toys covered the floor. A knife-whittled cross hung from a frayed piece of yarn above the bed. Higher up the wall was what looked like a dotted line of pencil marks, which upon closer inspection was a line of ants moving in single file toward a crack below the ceiling. There were no posters or picture frames on the scarred walls. She found this odd until it occurred to her that they would make about as much sense as a lamp in the room of a blind child. He gripped her hand. Will you stay with me, Miss Elizabeth? Beside me, I mean. Yes, of course. All night. Sure, if you want. Are you hungry? No, thanks. Can I get you some fresh pajamas? These are all I got. These here Spider-Mans. They are Spideys, aren't they? Sure are. How about if I go and get you a glass of water? No! His grip became a vice on her arm. Stay! All right, Wilbur. I'll stay. Satisfied, his grip loosened. His head fell back to the pillow. Elizabeth pulled up the sheet, using a dry corner of it to blot the beaded sweat from his brow. It's late, she said. You better try and get some sleep. Please, can I stay awake? Just for a while. Okay, but just a short while. He nodded, and his eyes blinked slowly closed. Thunder rumbled in the distance. Wilbur's body shuddered at the sound, but Elizabeth's calming hand settled him again. Why don't you tell me about your dream? She said. What for? Maybe talking about it will make it seem... less scary. Wilbur shook his head. It's best if I don't... Best if I don't think about it at all. That's the only way to keep them away. To keep who away? The creepers. Elizabeth couldn't suppress her smile and hoped that he couldn't sense it. Who are the creepers? Best to keep them right out of my head, Miss Elizabeth. That way they won't come. It's safe when everything stays dark. In my head, I mean. What a strange thing to say. Why's that? Most people feel just the opposite about the dark. I know when I was a little girl, I was very frightened of it. Not me. I feel good when I just see the dark. It's when stuff starts getting into my head that things go bad. Like when you have a scary dream? Yes, ma'am. Or even when I just get to thinking on scary things. I was always taught that an active imagination was a good thing, especially for little boys. Wonderful things can come out of it. Bad stuff, too, he whispered. Especially for someone like me. Like you? Blind folks. Mama says folks born blind don't know the way things really look. Just how we imagine them. And she says some blind folks even have a heightened imagination. Sounds like a pretty neat gift to me. Yeah. But sometimes... Mine gets heightened too much. Sometimes, when I get to thinking on things I see in my head, those things just get a little too real. Elizabeth's eyes drifted down to the candle, which had dribbled a puddle of wax at her feet. 
Wilbur, what do the creepers look like? They changing all the time. Depends on how I see them in my head, or maybe how I dreamed them. You understand? No, Wilbur, I'm afraid I don't. Can you explain it to me? His eyes opened again. Please, Miss Elizabeth, don't get me thinking about them. But I think it might help. No, please. He sat up quickly. I shouldn't be thinking on it. Panicked, he pressed his back against the headboard. His heels dug trenches into the mattress. Okay, Wilbur, calm down. No! He shut his eyes tightly. It's already too late! She placed a hand on his churning legs in an attempt to restrain him. I didn't mean to scare you. Everything's all right. No! It's too late, Miss Elizabeth. It don't take him long to come once I start seeing him. And I can see him now. <laughs> They're already. Wilbur, calm down. This is silly. It's impossible to see things in your head and then suddenly make them come to... The explosion of sound from the front room split the air and rocked the entire house. Elizabeth screamed. The candle slipped from her hand and fell to the floor, plunging the room into darkness. Wilbur went rigid beside her. It's too late, he said in a shaken whisper. They're here. I'm seeing them right now. And they're coming for us. Elizabeth turned to him, her heart a drum in her chest. It can't be true, she thought. It's not possible. In the next instant, the heavens opened overhead. Rain pelted the tin roof like machine gun fire. Lightning flashed, and in the fleeting blue strobe, Elizabeth found Wilbur's eyes fixed on the open door. Thunder crashed again, much closer than before. Elizabeth leaned toward Wilbur and whispered, What's happening, Wilbur? Please, tell me what's happening. Before he could answer, another percussive burst of sound shot out of the living room. The house lurched in a crack of splintering wood. Somewhere, a window shattered. A warm wind rushed into the room, swirling around them like grabbing hands. Elizabeth lunged for Wilbur and lifted him off the bed. His arms wrapped tightly around her neck. Clutching him to her chest, she rushed blindly from the room. She screamed again when she saw what awaited in the front room. The creepers had already blocked off the only route of escape. Against the continuous strobes of lightning, they appeared as human-like shadows, faceless save for a pair of narrow slit eyes that glowed bright green. Their movement was lithe, cat-like. Elizabeth saw two of them enter through the open doorway on wiry limbs. The door itself had been ripped from its hinges and now lay in scattered slats across the floor. Another creeper entered to her left, slithering over the jagged shards of a broken window set high into the wall. Once inside, the creeper proceeded to crawl headfirst down the wall until it reached the floor and came back up in a low predatory crouch a cloud of dust plumed into the room elizabeth turned another creeper had come in through the chimney and now stood coiled in a sprinter's pose atop the ashes in the fireplace a cannon shot of thunder shook the house wilbur buried his face into elizabeth's shoulder make it stop he cried please make it stop don't let them get me but the creepers were already circled.